morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another straight talk where we are having conversations with people uh, in our local community, people we know that uh, care for us and also have some wisdom and, uh, you know, some information for us as we walk through this pandemic. And so today we get the chance to reconnect with one of my good friends, uh, Joseph Teipel, who was in our youth group, Proving Ground, back in the day. And he uh, was one of those young men who was just so hungry to help people, so hungry to learn. And it's been amazing to watch how God has used him uh, over the years. And he has recently moved back to Buena Vista after being in the Denver uh, metro area and is here, and his, his role is running Chafee Community Foundation, Chafee County Community Foundation, and so we're going to hear from him right now. So, Joseph, thanks for, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks so much for having me, Zach. It's great to be here. Yeah. I'm... Man, it is so fun that you are back in Buena Vista. In fact, I, I found out that you were in Buena Vista because I was listening to the radio. I think this is like in November or something. And this voice came on, and I'm like, I know that guy. That's Joseph. Um, so very cool. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family, and what brings you back to to your hometown. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I grew up, was born and raised here in Buena Vista, um, as you mentioned. Um, Dad was a cabinet maker and and attends Clearview, and. Um, my mom was a Spanish teacher uh, in the high school for many years. Um, I, like you said, I moved to Denver um, when I graduated high school, attended University of Denver, um, had quite a few international travel experiences, mm. um, and then uh, started a nonprofit in Denver helping community um, increase their access to healthy food as well as um, become a little bit more resilient in their neighborhoods. And their family situations. Um, worked with that nonprofit for about uh, 12 years, um, and then uh, my wife and I adopted two kids, um, our two, our son and our daughter, um, just over two and a half years ago. Um, and when we when we came home with them, um, and sort of that first six or 12 months, um, it became clear that that we did not want to continue raising them in Denver. Um, yeah. Definitely nothing against Denver, but um, there was something calling us to a place where we could have a more real sense of community, um, where we would uh, not have to be nervous if they were out of our sight for 10 seconds, um, all those sorts of things. And and so we we started um, thinking about moving back up to Buena Vista, um, and really this chain of events that, that kind of came together to bring us back up. Um, in July of 2019, um, and shortly before we actually landed back here, I accepted the, the executive director role at the Chafee County Community Foundation. Um, so it was really fortuitous. My wife actually um, was hired as a third grade teacher at Avery Parsons, um, and our kids are in first and second grade, and and we're just we're loving it. Oh man, well I get to see some pictures now and then of your, your kids. I can't wait to, to meet them. They are so cute. And that's a whole, that's a whole nother story in itself as your adoption journey that I'd love our church to hear sometime because I got to hear about it through your dad and pray for you mm -hmm. guys a lot as you were in that transition. And, uh, man, just man. being able to see you see pictures of you guys all together as a family is, is pretty, is pretty awesome. What, what are your kids' names? My daughter is Vizire, and my son is Sonato. Sonato. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and your wife's name is at Ashley. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Well, uh, we're obviously big fans of Buena Vista and big fans of having you back here. And um, I really think, as I've been thinking about having you do an interview, uh, with your heart for people and your expertise of working with people, just the timing of you entering into this community before this pandemic struck, uh, I really think is not happenstance. And 
we're really thankful that that you guys are here in this community. Likewise, we're we're super thankful to be here. Now, Chafee County uh, Foundation, really, I that was not on my radar much until you got to town. I've heard you speak a lot more about it. There's been a lot more, uh, you know, I would say coverage or, you know, just maybe attention on it. Tell us the vision of, of this foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the Chafee County Community Foundation is a, is a pretty young organization. It's a nonprofit, um, just like uh, you know, Boys and Girls Club or, or um, any of the other uh, many nonprofits here in Chafee County. Um, and our mission is to increase philanthropic and capacity building resources for both nonprofits and residents in this county. Um, community foundations are a powerful tool in uh, almost every other community across the nation. There are over 1,200 community foundations in the U.S. And um, they always uh, reflect their community and invest back in their community and, and act as, as vehicles to uh, drive positive change, to um, increase philanthropy, uh, to drive both intellectual and, and financial uh, wealth in, in a community. Oh, wow. Yeah, neat. Tell us a little bit about the role of this foundation in this in, in our current crisis, what, uh, where, where do you guys see yourselves um, helping? And, you know, what's, what's your vision for this, this season for our county? Yeah, well, um, it's both a, a monumental crisis and a daily reminder of, of why I moved back and how special this place was growing up. Um, in, in the amazing demonstration of community that we see every day. Um, back during the Decker fire in, in late 2019, uh, the foundation established an emergency response fund. And that was really designed to um, act as a vehicle for folks that wanted to contribute um, to be able to do so. Um, and that fund was meant to be a permanent fund for Chafee County, not just for the Decker fire incident, but, but to really be here to be activated in times of crisis and emergency. And so um, in partnership with um, not only the municipal uh, governments, but also the county responders, you know, the folks that are on the front lines, um, both during the Decker fire and now of coordinating our response as a, as a county and as a community, um, we all recognize that it was a time to reactivate that fund um, because so many folks are negatively impacted by COVID-19 and, and all the public health measures that are, that are trying to slow that. Um, but there's, there's uh, almost a, probably an equal number of folks that are um, wanting to give and not financially burdened due to COVID and um, just wanting to pour out their resources to help their neighbors. Um, yeah. So this emergency response fund and the community foundation we really wanted to be um, a tool in the toolbox of our community to be able to help um, be a repository for those donations and then make sure that those are routed to folks that might otherwise slip through the cracks of, yeah. of assistance programs that are out there. Yeah, so it doesn't take the place of the assisted programs that are out there uh, for government assistance and unemployment, but to fill in some of the places that, that those don't don't respond to. Yeah, absolutely. And and what we we really believe in is coordinating and collaborating. Um, and so when we think about a crisis like this that's impacting hundreds and thousands of people in, in our county, uh, many of whom have just simply been laid off and have no more income coming in. Um, and yet they still have rent due, they still have utility bills, grocery bills, um, medical bills, all those things happening. So if, if we think about you know, a family that is all of a sudden not having income and yet uh, is seeking resources, um, each of those resources, whether they're government um, at the local level, um, state level, regional, uh, federal level, they all have their different qualifications and, and criteria. Um, and so in, with the absence of a fund like ours that's much more flexible, um, many, many, many households and individuals and families would not be served in, simply because 
they don't fit that box perfectly. Right. Um, so what we decided to do was was to say, look, we want we don't want to duplicate resources. We don't want folks double and triple dipping. Um, but what we really do want to do is make sure that folks don't go without help if they need it. Yeah. Um, and we felt like the best way to do that was to partner with the Department of Human Services for really the application process. Um, okay. We manage we manage our funds 100%. They don't leave our accounts unless they're going directly to a family in need. Um, but we do partner with the human services to help with the application process to make sure that if a family could qualify for not only financial assistance, but also um, food assistance or, okay. um, or these other programs that they can do so. Um, or if they don't, then they are passed kind of directly to us from DHS. So it's really been a partnership on the front end of the application process. Okay. Um, so yeah. if I'm if I'm a if I'm a family right now and I have been laid off or I'm in financial hardship and I'm wondering, man, I'm not sure how I'm gonna, you know, how I'm gonna walk through this. The the first step is to to go to the Department of Human Resources and kind of do their check-in process and fill out the paperwork that they had and then they do that intake form and when they look at it if I don't fit one of those boxes for state help or federal help then that name gets passed on to you is that is that how I'm hearing this that is correct and and so um, the the process to get started is actually super super easy um, and DHS has really tried to make this not a sort of typical government protocol. Um, so the, the easiest way for folks, especially with internet access to do this, is they can go to our website, chapeecommunity.org, um, and they can click on a button that says apply now, and they'll be taken to a Google form online okay. that will take about five minutes to fill out. Um, and well, and once they fill that out, um, it, that actually goes and is the basis for that initial screening. And that information is actually shared between DHS and us. Okay. So we see those applications directly, and then we coordinate with DHS staff to say, hey, this person is going to qualify for more money from you, DHS, so you take them, or they're really not going to work within your programs, and so we'll take them and, and help them out. Yeah. Give us Give us some examples of people recently that, uh, obviously not their names or any personal information, but just the types of people that, that you guys have been able to to help. Yeah, I mean, it, the stories have been overwhelming. Um, we've we've gotten assistance out to over 75 uh, households so far with, you know, probably 15 or 20 applications coming in per day. Um, and, and, you know, I, my mind goes to this family of five who... Um, for a couple of very technical reasons, did not qualify for DHS assistance, and they they would not have been able to receive a dime of help um, from any source. And we were able to get them a thousand dollars within, I think, three days of their, their applying. Oh. Um, and so, you know, that family in particular is five people that at least you know we can't cover a hundred percent of their expenses, mm -hmm. um, but we're at least getting them to where we know they're not going to lose the roof over their head. Yeah. Um, and kind of take that stress level down a notch. And then we've also been working a lot with um, individuals that uh, are, are all of our service workers, um, the folks working in hotels or restaurants, um, doing food and beverage service or cleaning um, VRBOs or helping our tourism based economy function. And they've almost all been laid off. Um, and so instead of them having to leave Chasey County, um, and then when we re reopen for business, not having any employees, um, we've been working with a lot of those folks to get them um, get them assistance. Yeah. Um, would you say that if you have a sense that you're going to have financial hardship coming up, you know, let's say you know you're getting your la you've gotten your last paycheck, and then you're going to get a possibly the stimulus check here in a little while, but you're looking out in the future, going, man you know, in a few weeks, this is going to be a real challenge. Would you say it's better to be proactive in kind of explaining your circumstances and filling out a form or wait until you're at, you know, you're actually closer to the situation where you're, you're out of resources? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in my, in my perspective, I would say um, 
get started now. Um, if you know that that cliff, so to speak, is coming, um, the, the, the whole intent of our fund um, is, that, is that folks don't go into, uh, that this one-time crisis or, or um, pandemic does not lead to a long-term um, crisis for the family. And so right. even if they say, hey, we could probably like squeak by and, but have zero dollars to our name um, and hopefully we'll find a job after this thing, you know, is over. They need they need to ask for help. Um, yeah. And I know that some folks don't like to do that, but but I I liken it to um, if you've ever willingly accepted a, a gift, even a Christmas gift. Um, this this is something that community members have poured out their generosity so that their neighbors and their family and their friends um, would be able to not just survive, but hopefully get as close back to normal as possible, as quickly as possible. So yeah. I would really encourage folks, if they know that they're going to need help, do it now. The other reason is just a pragmatic one. Um, we have a finite amount of resources, and, and the community has been extremely generous, but I know the need is going to outstrip the, the funds that we have. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Let's talk on the other side on funding. Um, tell us a little bit about you know, how you can give to this fund. Tell us a little bit about what percentage uh, is taken for administrative fees for you guys to process, uh, you know, the applications and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, to start with, we, we don't take a dime of, of administrative fees from this emergency response fund. Um, that's a commitment that the, that the foundation made back when we established the fund that in perpetuity, um, it's part of our mission to, to really be there in times of crisis. So um, we are, uh, the flip side of that is that we're, you know, dipping into the, our reserves to pay for all of our time in doing this, but that's that's what we do and that's why we're here. So we don't take a dime of administrative uh, fees. The only fee that's assessed is if you donate via credit card, um, you know, there's that two or 3% credit card fee. Okay. Um, so 100% of your dollars are going to go directly to folks that need it. Okay. Um, and and really what we're seeing is that folks um, are donating anywhere from $10 to $5,000. And mm. every gift is something that really makes a difference. Yeah. Wow. That's great. And we can people can donate right on your website. Is that the best way to access uh, those those resources or to, to give? Yeah, absolutely. jpcommunity.org. Um, they can donate right there uh, via credit card. Um, they can set up a one-time or recurring. Um, they're also welcome to send a check. And if they send a check, they can make it out to uh, CCCF and put ERF or Emergency Response Fund in the memo line. Um, our PO box is 492 here in Buena Vista. So okay. um, we can accept those donations either way. Yeah, well, well, that's great. I've also been encouraged by the community, the unity around this from not only government, you know, like our local government here in, in Buena Vista, but also, uh, you know, churches and lots of different people pitching into this fund to, to say, let's all help. And I know having a single point for people to go and assess where they can get funds is really helpful because it can get pretty confusing uh in all this so thanks thanks for your forethought in that and the partnerships that you've set up and um we're just really thankful for this fund and the way that it's helping people i want to just ask you one more question before we close up and uh you know i think the last time we really spent much time together was in your uh, at your wedding and i know that a part of your nonprofit work uh in denver was fueled really by you know, your passion for, for God and, and living out your faith. Tell us a little bit about, about that with, with this foundation and how, how that's been integrated in your life. Yeah, my, my faith journey has been one that um, has led me to a lot of different places um, and led me to a place where uh, I cannot separate um, the the actions that I that I do and, and the, the circumstances that I find myself in and the um, work that I feel called to from um, from my faith, right? There's, I think, um, so often I, I hear a, um, 
a desire in society to, to segregate things and to say it's either this or that, or we need to define um, one thing uh, that's that's causing this. And for me, I really feel like it's the, the, the faith that I have is, is leading me in a holistic way um, in everything that I'm doing. And I'm so grateful um, that, that I've been led here um, to reconnect with my hometown and my community. Um, my wife and I could not be uh, more fortunate and more thankful. Well, that is awesome, Joseph. I, again, I want to say how, how good it is for me to um, just to spend time with you and look forward to more time as, as we're able to get out of being sheltered in. And so thankful that your family's here. And I just see the wisdom and the things that you learned in Denver uh, have been so helpful in the ways that you've navigated and helped streamline some of this, this help and this fund. And I've heard great things from the people who have interacted with the foundation or with you of just your servant's heart, your your willingness to really work together against all kinds of, you know, barriers to to help people. So uh, thanks for for being here and thanks for spending time with us. And if uh, if folks have questions, we want to let you know that you can uh, you can reach out here to the church um, at info at clearviewcommunity.org. Or Joseph, tell us again uh, the website that they can go to to get information about the foundation. Yeah, it's chafeecommunity.org, and our phone number is 719-204-5071. More than happy to, to chat anytime. Okay. Well, everybody, thanks for joining us uh, this morning, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And I hope the information we shared this morning is, is helpful uh, to families. Feel free to pass it along when you have people that are wondering about how to either be generous and help during this time or get help. So God bless and have a, have a great day.